All right, welcome to another episode of TGIK. Uh, this is, we're already into December. What is today? Today's the 15th. So that happened awful fast. And this is episode 18, uh, which kind of also happened super, super fast. <laughs> so let me know if, uh, if you can hear me okay. Um, you know, every time I do this, there's like, you know, I'm plugging and unplugging stuff and I'm trying to get the, the microphone set up right. So I see a green bar moving, but it's always great when folks can confirm it. Um, so what I want to cover today is, uh, let's see. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what I saw at KubeCon and reInvent, because that's where I was over the last couple of weeks and why we haven't seen uh, seen much going on here with TGIK. Oh, so audio is fine. All right, yeah, awesome, great. Uh, nice to see you, Steve and Fernando. Steve works for us. So, you know, it's always good when you pack the, uh, pack the audience with, with friendly faces. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so I was out over the last couple of weeks. I did uh, Thanksgiving in, here in the U.S. and then, uh, and then reInvent, um, which was, was crazy with the, uh, the EKS launch and all that. And then, uh, hey, Eddie, hey, you day. Um, and then uh, KubeCon was last week. And so it's been an exhausting couple of weeks. Finally back, hi Liz, finally back, on hell, uh, finally back here at home in Seattle and uh, uh, looking forward to, to picking up TGIK again. Uh, so yeah, so um, all right, let's get to it. So first of all, I wanna call attention to my awesome t-shirt. So this is, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to see exactly the color, but what this is, and here, let me, I'm so, like, I know this is such a Seattle thing, so let me go and I'll just switch to the screen. So there's this drive-in here in Seattle, this burger place called Dick's, and uh, I, I, I really like their burgers too much. Um, but, uh, but they were selling these t-shirts and they were just amazing, and it has their logo. But what you don't see, and this is what's hard to figure out, is that... Uh, when you buy their like high-end burger and buy high-end, <laughs> it, it comes in this like copper foil uh, wrapper, and that's the color of the of the reflective here also. Uh, so <laughs> hey, well, uh, so yeah, so I'm wearing my fun T-shirt here. I just felt like I had to explain it. Otherwise, people are like, "Why do you have a T-shirt that says Dicks on it? It's a burger place. Really control yourselves." Um, and then uh, then Tim sent me this awesome mug for TGIK that he bought for me called that's some Gandalf level wizard shit right there. Um, and maybe we'll have, we'll have some uh, reason to refer to this motto as we go through the episode today. <laughs> I got Diet Coke in there because we're going towards the afternoon. Uh, and our coffee machine broke and we just got a new one and I'm really unsure about it. I don't trust it. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have, let's see, so there's a couple of things that uh, we at Heptio talked about at, at KubeCon, and I wanna bring that stuff up first, um, just to sort of talk about some of the interesting stuff we're doing. And then I wanna talk about some of the other interesting stuff that I saw going on in the community. Um, the, uh, the thing that I was talking about most about what Heptio has been doing is this project called Case on It. Now, this was something that we started quite a while ago. We did no beer today. Sorry, Timo. Uh, we did a. Uh, we're trying to. I'm trying to like you know dial down the bro factor, and and you know beer is not helping. So so we're gonna do Gandalf level wizard shit Diet Coke. All right, so um, so Kaysana is a way to define your um, your application, how you want to run your application. So it's it's a way to start thinking about how do we manage the the manifest, the YAML, for for lack of a better term, uh, in a in a scalable way. And now it's not YAML, um, uh, and and we're working at ways of of, of creating sort of a a way to actually import your, your, your existing configurations. But, um, and I'm not gonna go into a deep dive on this. At some future episode, I'll go into a deep dive of the stuff that we've done with Case on it. But you can start a tour here, or if you wanna go um, and do like a two minute quick tour that I, that I narrate, um, you can go to youtube.com slash heptio and, uh, 
And there's a Quesana demo here that you can go ahead and check out. Um, and so this is something we're really excited about because our goal out of this was to make it much easier for people to get a little bit of that cube control run experience, but then also have something that will grow with them as their needs in terms of how they manage their configs, the type and number of clusters that they're pushing to. As that evolves over time, we wanted to build a tool set that would actually evolve with them. So that's what we were trying to do with Case on it. So please take a look at that. Let me know what you think. Um, and let's see, so I'm just checking the chat here. Um, heard that is a compliment to Helm. Can I describe that? Yeah, so, so, um, so Helm is a great way for taking application descriptions uh, that somebody has written, uh, whether it be like WordPress or what have you, and then being able to, to get those things out into the world and, and get them deployed to your cluster. But writing Helm charts is not everybody's favorite thing. In fact, I, I think the, the, the way that the mix of YAML and templating based on sort of text templating can be really, really painful. So that's one thing that, that we're looking at is, is as Helm 3 planning gets in, underway next year, and so that's going to be late February in, uh, in the, the Helm Summit in Portland. As Helm 3 planning gets going next year, we want to look for opportunities to use Case on it as a way to author Helm charts and then Helm being a way to deploy them. Um, and so, uh, but right now you can deploy directly from a command line with Case on it. So if you don't need some of the stuff that you get with Tiller, uh, you can skip some of that and do something a little bit simpler. Um, uh, so you want a case on it episode? Yes, I'll do it. Um, and I was really torn this time on whether I wanted to do case on it or whether I wanted to explore the meta controller. But uh, uh, it, it's kind of it's it's tough because I always know that we have more great ideas that we're working on. So I, you know, I want folks to start using it and to start telling us what they think. But on the other hand, like it's going to be even better and better the longer I wait. So and I don't want to like overdo it. <laughs> Um, but uh, but yeah, so the idea is that we can use Quesonet as a way to author Helm charts and then use Helm as a way to deploy them. Um, but Quesonet can also do it, uh, deploy directly if you have simpler needs. Um, and so, yeah, so that's the way that we've been thinking about that. Um, the, uh, yeah, so, and then there's the video there about that. So please check that out. Let me know what y'all think about that. Um, and uh and if you really want to go deep on things like Quesana and configuration management and how to actually manage application definitions, there's the application definition app def working group, um, which is sort of a coordination of SIG apps and SIG CLIs and, and you know, probably bringing in some API machinery stuff about how can we build a thriving ecosystem of tools that, that help you manage your, your definitions. Um, okay, so the next thing that we were talking about at... KubeCon is we did a, a thing with Microsoft around um, around uh, support with Arc. So making sure that Azure or Azure, do you guys say Azure or Azure? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, as we actually do that stuff, um, uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, we had great support for Azure in terms of being able to back up and work with the cloud provider to create uh, a backup and disaster recovery solution. And so, so that's something that we were announcing there. So Soima says, how much uh, of complexity can Quesonet handle, like passing environment variables, et cetera? That's, um, that's some of the stuff that, that I think we have some good primitives right now on how to do that. And we're going to work on making that stuff better and better over time. Things like config maps and what have you and where you do and how you do templatization. So check it out. Let us know sort of like what some of the features that you think might be missing. And that's, that's definitely something that we're going to be, uh, that we're going to be looking at. Um, so <laughs> Liz says, TechCrunch has the same visual identity as The Onion. Uh, yes, and a lot of the stuff that they say, you're like, is that real or not also? So I, I you know, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe that, that's for a reason. I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, complexity with YAML definitions, um, and you want to move the CD to case on it. That, that's one of the things that, that as we build case on it, we really wanted it to be a building block that you can bind into a CD system. So, so that it really sort of is, is super flexible where you could use like, you know, over time, we're hoping that you can deploy it with, with Helm, but then also, you know, if you have you know, like in your Jenkins pipeline or whatever you're using, you can also deploy directly with, with, uh, with Quesonet and then everything that Quesonet does is actually built to be checked into Git. 
But this episode's not about case on it, so I don't want to go too deep into that. <laughs> but I really, really encourage you all to check it out. Um, so let's see. Oh, and then since we're talking about Helm, the one thing I did want to call attention to is um, so Angus Lee's he did a blog post on this. Um, let's see about security in Helm. So this is something that that I've been looking at a little bit. I know Angus has been looking at it. If you're running Helm in a production environment, here let me increase the font size here a little bit. And I'll put I'll put these these uh, all these URLs in the in the description. If you're running Helm in a production environment where anything is security sensitive, or even if you're not, it's worthwhile to start reading through this. Uh, when when Helm two was first started, really the 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 most common thing was was clusters without our back, and there wasn't a lot of sort of security sensitivity. As we've continued to improve that, there are some features in Helm that you have to activate, and some things that you have to be aware of in terms of how Helm works. So. Uh, so this is, I just want to get the word out about this just so that folks know that, hey, if I'm using Helm, I need to be thinking about these things. So um, we'll put that over there. All right. Um, so before we move on to the, oh man, I already navigated away because I was looking at stuff. Before we start looking at the, the thing that I really want to di uh, uh, dig into today, um, which is this Cube Meta Controller project? Does anybody have any other sort of questions about KubeCon? Uh, so this is one of the more interesting things that I saw that I thought was really cool. It's something I've been keeping my eye on for a while. It showed up in one of the keynotes. Um, it's it's all being done by uh, by Anthony Ye uh, out of Google and Mountain View. Um, uh, I don't think I've ever met Anthony. Anthony, I don't know if I've met you. If you ever see this, say hi sometime. I probably have. I don't know. Maybe I haven't. If I have and I'm not remembering, I apologize. But um, but this really interesting idea about how do we actually make it easier to write controllers. So that's the thing that we're going to go ahead and. Uh, oh, you're here. How's it going, Anthony? Great. Um, thanks for tuning in, man. Hopefully, uh, you can answer some questions when I <laughs> when I have some problems. <laughs> but I'm going to go through it. I haven't. I, I've I've read through the code a little bit. I haven't actually run it yet. So I'm really looking forward to uh, to digging into this. But before we move on, anybody have any other no no other KubeCon questions? Um, okay, conduit and Istio. Um, so service meshes are a super deep topic. Um, there was definitely a ton of buzz around service meshes at KubeCon. Uh, uh, you know, obviously with Istio and Conduit being part of it. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my take on it is that we're still a ways out before mainstream customers and users are really looking at deploying this stuff. Um, there's still a ton of innovation in this space. It's an exciting space. I think one of the things is that there's this question, I think, in a lot of folks' mind is, you know, how do we start breaking this problem down? Where do different pieces of, of, of uh, capability belong? How much do we sort of bundle this together in one sort of unified experiences versus being able to, to find ways to start chipping away with this in more uh, incremental ways? Um, that's some of the stuff that I, I've heard folks talking about with respect to service meshes, because it is a, it is a big system to start adopting and to start swallowing, because you, you essentially have a new system that's sort of in the data path for all of your applications. That's obviously something that folks are going to take super, super seriously. Um, and so uh, it's fascinating seeing, seeing where all that stuff is going. So uh, let's see. And then Conduit, the, uh, the, the Buoyant folks um, uh, did, an, did an amazing job of going through and, and reacting to sort of how fast this world has been moving in getting conduit out. And so uh, it's really a rethink of a lot of the experiences that they've had with Linkerd over time uh, about how can they uh, uh, rethink some of that stuff and, and uh, create a new system that's really focused on delivering some value. So super exciting stuff going on there with conduit also. Federico, will there be a similar workshop you did in Austin as well in, in Copenhagen? So for those not familiar, we did a couple of days of training before uh, in some of the days leading up to KubeCon. And it was uh, uh, it was really exciting for me. I, I hung out a little bit. I met with folks. We gave everybody a copy of the Kubernetes Up and Running book. Um, and so, and, and it was really, 
for me, it was exciting because I saw a lot of folks who were not very familiar with Kubernetes go from like, hey, what the heck is this thing to, wow, I feel like I have a good grounding to actually go off and start applying this stuff. So. So that's really, really, really interesting to me. Um, I would love to do that again in Copenhagen. I don't think we have any concrete plans yet, but um, if it's something that uh, it was successful for us, so I think I think there's a good chance that we're going to be doing that again. Uh, and then, well, it can't wait to see the KubeCon recorded videos. Me too. Um, one of the things, ideas that I threw around uh, last KubeCon or KubeCon EU was there's so many videos. I don't know if you all looked at the at like the number of concurrent sessions at KubeCon, it was really out of control. So there were sometimes upwards of like five, eight more sessions going on at a time. So not only was it physically impossible to, to see all the sessions, it was actually really physically impossible to see all the sessions that you wanted to see. Um, and so as those videos come out, one of the things I wanna do is start highlighting the uh, uh, the things that we think are really interesting and doing sort of a quick summary of that. I was thinking like maybe doing a blog series with uh, around sort of TLDW, Too Long Didn't Watch, where we can go through and highlight some of the more interesting videos that we found and sort of boil it down. And, and maybe if, if folks want to dig deeper, they can go ahead and then watch the video. Um, uh, so if you, if you all see videos that you think are especially good, that you think deserve that treatment, uh, go ahead and as they come up, send them my way. Um, yeah, incremental but complete solutions. Yeah, it's hard. It's easier said than done. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and jump in then and start taking a look at Meta Controller. And um, I, like I said before, I, I've been looking at this project for a while. I know Anthony's been sort of noodling with it for quite a while. Also, um, it's gone through some refactoring, some some uh, uh, rethinking about how it relates to where you run custom code. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a relatively simple idea, but I think it's super, super powerful. And so um, uh, it, you know, when it showed up in, in Hen's keynote, uh, I was really excited to see that and uh, I wanted to take some time to dig in. So here we go. Um, so first of all, <laughs> there's some like, there's some uh, warnings here. I, I don't think, you know, anybody should uh, people should take this seriously? This not official Google project. There's you know one contributor, right? <laughs> so you know here we go. It's Anthony's Anthony's baby, obviously, um, and uh, you know it's really more of a proof of concept. But in my mind, this really paints the direction forward in terms of how can we take some of the things that are more complicated and rethink them in terms of, of easier to activate, just write a little bit of glue type of thing to really enhance the, the Kubernetes experience. Um, so I think it's worth comparing and contrasting this with the TGIK controller that I wrote uh, over the course of episode seven, eight, and nine. Um, this was some hard slogging to go ahead and do this stuff. I think, you know, in total, I probably spent somewhere on the order of, I don't know, five hours actually getting a simple controller up that worked. It's probably, you know, this is not, not you know, uh, uh, production ready either, uh, but this is sort of using the client go and writing stuff from scratch. And you can sort of walk through the process with me as I went ahead and did that. The, the purpose of this controller is to, and I don't know if we can do this exactly the same way with Meta Controller, but I think it's interesting to compare and contrast. The purpose of this controller here is to, if I can find it, um, is to essentially take a set of secrets um, in some sort of canonical namespace um, and then uh, take those secrets and duplicate them across a bunch of other namespaces. And so uh, this came from a discussion that I had with somebody after a meetup where they're like, hey, we have like database secrets. How do we distribute those without checking them in? And one of the ideas that I had is, well, you could write a controller that has sort of like a, a template namespace and takes all the secrets out of that and actually, you know, copies them to, to other stuff, other namespaces. And so this essentially watches the, the set of namespaces, the set of secrets, and then figures out like what is the right secrets to actually create and delete in different namespaces. Um, so that so that took me three episodes to do that. It took me quite a while to be serious and, and sort of get that to the point. I think it's going to be interesting to sort of do a little bit of a, I don't know if we'll get down to code, but to do a little bit of a thought experiment of like, could we do something similar using the meta controller 
and and how much easier it would be. Um, and I think what we'll probably end up getting through in this episode is getting the Meta Controller installed and maybe going through some of the examples that Anthony put in there, and we'll learn some of the capabilities as we go. Um, he said, so Anthony says, the current Meta Controller APIs can't do that yet, but future APIs will. Yeah, and I think that's the interesting thing is that Anthony has here a, a set of patterns of like common types of controllers, which reduce the amount of logic that you have to think. And the stuff that I did in the, in the, the TGIK controller doesn't fit into one of those patterns that he's written yet, but there's definitely, you can look at this and you can see, oh, hey, we can start like, we can start making it easier to do different more types of patterns. And so, all right, so there's two things that he has here. So he has the Lambda controller and then he has the initializer controller. Uh, the Lambda controller is, um, what this does is, let's see, so let's read it. I'm going to read it out loud just because I want to make sure I don't miss anything. A lot of times when I do these things, I skim and then I miss steps and then you all are telling me that I did it wrong. And so I'm going to be a little bit more careful this time. Lambda controller is an API provided by MetaController designed to facilitate custom controllers whose primary purpose is to manage a set of child objects based on the desired state and a parent object. So I think this is the interesting pattern is that you define a parent object and then that parent object manages a set of child objects. And we see this happen all over the place. This is how replica set works. This is how deployment works. This is how, how uh, job, job, job set works, right? This is how um, uh, stateful sets work. So there's, there's a ton of places where we see this pattern of parent object just managing a set of children based on some sort of business logic of things come and go. And it's super, super common when we look at sort of like operators, right? So it's like, hey, give me a, you know, foobar database. All right, let me go ahead and actually, you know, create the foobar database based on that description. Um, so yeah, super interesting stuff going on there. The meta controller will handle all the, okay, so workload controllers like deployment, stateful set are examples of existing controllers that fit this pattern. The meta controller will handle all the behaviors necessary to interact with the Kubernetes API, including watches, label selectors, owner references, orphaning and adoption, optimistic concurrency, and exponential backoff. So this is like this is actually important stuff because it's easy to write a controller that kind of works uh, when you first look at it. Uh, it's hard to write one that works well at scale. It's really easy to do things like, like you know, overload your API server as you move from running sort of one instance of your of your you know controller parent object to like a thousand, right, or you know even a hundred. Um, let's see, object caches will be shared amongst all controllers implemented via Meta Controller, keeping the watch load on the API server low. And this is another problem that we have with Kubernetes over time is that a lot of components in the Kubernetes world, a lot of controllers, what they end up doing is is keeping an in-memory cache of some subset of the cluster state so that they can operate on that stuff locally. And so this is, this is if you know, and there's a bunch of stuff in client Go to make it easy to do that stuff. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of load on the server to actually keep that stuff uh, up to date and it can take a lot of memory. And so being able to share that across lots of controllers is a really good thing. The only thing you need to write is the hook that takes as input the current state and outputs a desired state, both of which are in the form of version JSON manifest representing Kubernetes API objects. So you get a hook, you get the current state, desired state, there's JSON manifest to be able to do that stuff, and the process is conceptually similar to writing a static generator or template for pre-processing files to be sent to cube control, except that meta controller turns it into a dynamic controller that constantly maintains your desired state and reacts to any changes made to a parent object. So this is actually an important pattern also, and it's something that it, <laughs> I screwed up when I was doing my, my custom controller. Um, the simplest way to think about controllers is to say, let me do it as a one-shot thing. Let me take what I want to do. Let me define what I want to like, you know, like what my desired state is. Let me make that as simple as possible as a one-shot type of thing. And then you wrap the sort of update and diff around that one shot. So it's like, if I can define what I want in one go, then I can put structure on top of it that helps me continuously ensure that, right? And, and usually that act of doing that computation of derivation, I want to take this, I want to do that, it's so computationally cheap that if you redo that all the time, it's no big deal. And it turns out this pattern of let me do it in a sort of one-shot type of thing and then automate around it is super duper duper common 
even outside of like the Kubernetes space. So like when I was doing the Quar D stuff for the Kubernetes up and running, which is my little sample application, I learned React to do that, which is a JavaScript front end framework. And there's a lot in common with the way that we think about controllers in Kubernetes and the way you think about sort of desired state in systems like React. And so you see these patterns across computer science stuff really repeat again and again and again. All right, and so Anthony has some examples here. We have cat set, blue-green deployment, and index job. Um, so these two are in JavaScript, and this one's in Python. The blue-green deployment one is the one that actually first brought uh, 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 this, this project to my attention. Um, somebody was wondering on Twitter, hey, how do we do blue-green deployments? And I'm like, I, you know, I haven't seen a, a super great example. Somebody else said, hey, we can use Spinnaker. I'm like, okay, you can, but Spinnaker is a is some... Um, Gandalf level, level wizard shit, right? <laughs> Spinnaker's, Spinnaker's a pretty heavy hammer for this stuff. It really brings a lot more to it beyond just blue-green deployments. And somebody pointed me at this project early on, uh, and I'm like, hey, that's a really, really interesting way to think about that. Um, just, just to be clear, you can kind of fake blue and green deployments with the current deployment object, but to really do it right, I think you need to not only deal with uh, creating and bringing down replica sets, but you might want to also manage uh, uh, updating uh, a service on the side. I don't know if this one does. I'm going to have to actually dig into it. So the other type of pattern here that Anthony supports is an initializer controller, which uses the initializer feature, which, which uh, was in alpha in 1.8. Um, this is a way that as objects get submitted, you can go ahead and and add some stuff to them. And so there's a lot of interesting things that you can that can be done with initializers. Um, it turns out, and they're, and they're kind of a little bit of a subset of admission controllers, right? Where, where you want to be able to, to have some server-side components that can sort of put their own mark and do their own modifications as things like pods get submitted to the API. One of the interesting things that um, uh, the API machinery folks are stepping back a little bit from initializers, or at least they're putting some of that effort on pause and moving towards a webhook, uh, mutating webhook, where where uh, does a lot of what initializers does is a little bit easier to get up and running with, and um, uh, but also doesn't apply just to the initialization of an object the first time you create it, but also any other mutation that happens to the object. And so um, I'm not sure that that sort of like webhooky type of things like admission control or webhook admission controllers with uh, 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 that can mutate, whether that actually fits into the meta controller framework, my guess is, is, is not right now. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and, and, and get started with this. This is sort of the extent of the documentation, so you can tell it's still very much a, a sort of prototype type of project. I mean, if we look in, like, say, the blue-green deployment, it's like, okay, here's a little, uh, a little example of sort of, you know, what it does, but there's uh, um, some of the object models around this stuff and sort of like how you write these things. I think we're just going to have to start reading some code to really figure things out. Okay, so let's go ahead and install it. So it says just apply the manifest. Um, I'm not running on GKE, so we should be okay. I assume I have to clone this. Um, copied. Uh, uh, cube control get nodes. I have a two node, one master cluster running in AWS using the, the, the um, Heptio quick start. Um, I'm looking forward to having this be an EKS cluster, but uh, uh, it's still very early days for EKS, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so git clone. We'll go ahead and we'll clone that. Let me put the desk up over here a little bit. And um, let's see. And so QMeta controller. All right, so one of the things that I like to do... Oh, whenever I look at one of these is let's look at these manifests and see what's going on. So we have an RBAC manifest. And what this is saying is that, uh, let's see, we're hard-coded to the metacontroller namespace. So this creates the namespace. This goes through, creates a service account in that namespace, also called metacontroller. 
and then creates a cluster role and a cluster role binding so that we give this thing permission. And we're giving it essentially root on the, we are giving it root. I mean, <laughs> it has, it has uh, access to essentially everything, everything in the cluster across all namespaces. This is, um, this is a, it's a little scary, but I think with the role that meta controller is playing, it's very difficult to do anything that would be more scoped than this, yet still be widely useful. One of the things that is interesting, just trying to think this through. One of the things, when we look at things like the controller manager in Kubernetes, it can run in a mode where it actually uses one service account across all the controllers that are built into the controller manager, or it can run in a mode where it actually uses a service account per type of controller. And with the per type of controller, there's all this sort of definition of like, well, this particular controller needs these this access, and this type of controller needs these this access. And as it does that, um, the it's more secure because you're essentially you know boxing in what controllers have access to. Uh, but it's less efficient because I mentioned the whole idea of sharing these watch caches. That's difficult to do uh, uh, when you're actually looking across multiple different identities because those watch, you don't want to actually have information leak from one controller to another via, via a shared cache. Um, so what you could do, and this is what Andy's saying here, is that if you know you're only using Meta Controller for a certain set of things, you could go ahead and scope this down and dynamically increase this. I think it's also, you know, idea we could go through and, and like have, uh, uh, you know, I, I can think of like there are ideas on how to do this, but I think it's 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 understandable why it's this way right now. So I don't think this is anything to freak out about. Um, there are other systems where I'll see something like this and I'm like, oh, those people are just lazy. They didn't actually go through and map it. The nature of what the meta controller stuff does really means that it's difficult to do this without uh, uh, without having to make things a lot more complicated in other places. So so Anthony says, I have ideas for scoping the down the permissions per controller. We'll be in a forthcoming design doc. So he's way ahead of us there. That's cool stuff. Um, all right, and then the, the controller itself, the interesting thing here is that we have some custom resource definitions here. Uh, one of them for the Lambda controllers, one of them for the initializer controllers. And so that means what I'm getting from here, and, and we'll see this later, is that the way you program this is with CRDs itself. And so you create a CRD, that CRD then defines how, you know, what types of controllers the meta controller is managing. And then we have this thing here, there's one replica. Uh, I assume there's no sort of multi-replica leader election handoffy types of stuff that would totally be possible. But honestly, for something like this, if it crashes and comes back up, your mean time to recovery for your meta controller is probably on the order of how long it would take you to do leader election in a uh, in a, in a multi mastery type of type of situation. So we're going to go through and replicas match label. So this is a very simple deployment that goes ahead, and you know you can tell we're still we're running latest here, which means it's a it's a little bleeding edge and uh, having it logged to standard error. These are some Googleisms here. Uh, most folks outside of Google would not specify the command when specifying an image because it's built into the command. And then log to standard error is a glog thing. Uh, Google by default logs to a file internally. Um, whereas if you want to do cube control logs, you want to make sure that you actually send stuff out to standard error. Uh, sorry for calling you out there, Anthony. <laughs> so this is totally reasonable. It's going to be run one thing plus a bunch of stuff. One of the interesting things here, and I think this is a pattern that is not well established, is that when you're doing custom resource definitions, is it the job of your controller to self-register those things, or is registration of those things really an admin action that happens out of, out of band when you actually install things? And we've seen really a different split. Like some controllers will do their own sort of like, I'm gonna register my own CRDs. And then other controllers are like, hey, you know, like, like I'm gonna, that's an admin thing. I shouldn't necessarily have permission to muck with CRDs. I like that this stuff gets broken out. While the meta controller does have access to essentially do whatever and could create its own uh, uh, own CRDs, by doing it this way, there's an opportunity to scope down the permissions that the meta controller gets later, and uh, and not have to give it permission to actually create and manage CRDs. All right, so let's go through and install this.
Uh, cube control apply dash f manifest star. Let's. How would I do? Do that. That works. There we go. All right. So we are up and running, or at least we we might be. Uh, cube control. The n meta controller get pods. Oh, uh, it's creating. Oh, it's running. Okay, so now we're up and running. Uh, the rest of these things were just configuration, so I think we're good to go. Um, so that's installation, pretty easy. Um, now let's go through and let's see, which of these do we want to actually play with? The cat set, the blue-green deployment. I want to play with the index job. Anybody, anybody want to do something different? I think that's going to be interesting. Um, because I think this is something that is is not obvious on how you do this with Kubernetes right now. Um, okay, so this is an example Lambda controller that implements a custom rollout strategy based on a technique called blue-green deployment. The controller ramps up... Okay, so bl funny blue-green deployment story. Um, so the idea with blue-green uh, deployment is that you have like a copy of your application, you bring up another copy of your application, and then you swing your your uh, your service over to actually point at the at the new the new application, um, which con compare and contrast this what the deployment does by itself, which is uh, by default, which is do a rolling update where you'll actually have traffic served to both the new and the old thing at the same time. With blue green, you try and make a sharp cut over between the old thing and the new thing. Um, so they rebuilt the IKEA here in Seattle. Um, and the way they rebuilt the IKEA is they took the parking lot of the old IKEA and they bulldozed that and they built a new Ikea at the parking lot and now they're tearing down the old Ikea, right? So they did blue-green deployment of Ikea stores, right? So they kept the old store open while they rebuilt a new one and then they actually tore down the old one. Um, so maybe we should call that like blue-yellow deployment. I don't know because that's the Ikea colors, <laughs> but that's I think the best example I've seen of blue-green deployment in the wild. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's the new IKEA color, colored green. I don't know. No, no, it should be, right? Because the old one was blue. The new one should be green. But no, I, I haven't actually been to the new one yet. Uh, but, uh, but supposedly it's two stories and everything, so it's totally crazy. <laughs> yeah, we should bike shed about the IKEA color. Thanks, Jess. <laughs> All right, so that's blue-green deployment in, in physical space. All right, so the controller ramps up a completely separate replica set in the background for any changes to the pod template and then waits for the new replica set to be fully ready and available, uh, all pods specifying the min ready seconds, and then switches a service to point to the new replica set. Finally, it scales down the old replica set. All right, so that's really cool. Um, so, so reduce the amount of requests, parking space. Yeah, so what they had to do is they had to go through and they had sort of off-sites par parking for a while. Um, which, you know, Ikea is a zoo on a good day, but then you had everybody sort of parking off site. They had the room to be able to do that and they had like shuttle buses coming in. Um, all right, so, okay, so this sounds great. And I think, you know, this is still bare bones. I think a lot of times what people want to do when they do blue-green deployment is they want features like, I want a separate load balancer for the non-active one so that I can run some tests about against it since before I actually switch things over. Sometimes you want an explicit sort of like step. So there's stages that you want to do where it's like, okay, I want to bring up the new thing. Okay, now I want to test that. Now I want to actually flip things over. Okay, I want to keep the old one running so that I can flip back if I see problems. Okay, I finally have made it. Let's actually turn down the old one. And so I'm guessing that controlling sort of like, you know, that stuff in a sort of lockstep manner is not something that's built in here, but it doesn't seem crazy that that's, that's something that you could totally do. All right, and so let's go through. There's the there's three files here. So blue green controller .yaml is the thing that defines the blue green controller. Sync.js is the thing that uh, that's the code that implements this. Um, so uh, uh, soima uh, somia um, move data in case it's not stateful set. Um, most of the time when people do this stuff, it's it's usually for stateless applications um, just because uh, managing state across things coming and going can be very, very complicated. It's not unusual 
And this is something that you could also do with a meta controller. Is I'm, I'm thinking maybe is like one of the things that people want to do as they do deployments, and it's not easy to do this today. Is you might want to actually like take down the old thing. Now you everything's down. You have downtime. Run a database migration, like, and then bring up the new thing. And being able to actually control that and actually have both upgrade and downgrade steps that actually run while nothing else is running of the workload is something that's not super cloud native. Um, it's not something that anybody would necessarily do in, you know, as they were writing systems to really work with Kubernetes. You really want to be able to support old and new scheme at the same time and do online scheme upgrades. But it's super common, right? It's like when you look at enterprise applications, this is a really, really common thing. And so having a deployment that that knows how to do migrations, like a migration deployment, is something else that we could do with perhaps the meta controller where we have both sort of the 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 runtime template, but then we also have upgrade downgrade templates for, for how we actually do that upgrade and downgrade. Um, and so that's how I think people start thinking about state in these types of types of things. The other thing is, is that stateful set itself is really interesting, but it, it works best with workloads that know that they're being managed from the outside. Um, and so if you don't have a workload that knows that works well with stateful set, then that's where you actually have a controller on the outside that may actually, in a much more domain specific way, bring pods up and down. As it's bringing pods up, maybe you want to start sending signals to something saying, hey, we want to like sort of like you, you want to join this thing. We want to replicate. We want to add and remove stuff from a database. So, so a lot of times you need some custom logic to actually work with the application to make it work uh, in a Kubernetes setting. And so a lot of times stateful set is not the end of the story. It's really the start of the story and you need some other type of management on top of it. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so so Anthony says that's actually what I was trying to automate with Kubernetes when I came up with this idea, and MetaController is his yak, and he's still shaving it. Um, yes, this is it's a beautiful yak that you have here, Anthony. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead, and we're gonna go ahead and let's look at these files. Let me go back to the editor, um, and let's. Oh wait, we have. Okay, so we. Blue green, okay, so we have the controller itself. And so we have yet another resource definition, which is great. Um, this, is, this is essentially, instead of having a deployment object, we're actually gonna have a blue green deployment object. Um, so the kind here is blue green deployment. The API group is uh, control, cuddle, ectal, cuddle, I don't know. Dot, uh, how, do you, how do you say your, your name, Anthony? Enisoc? Enisoc? I don't even know. I'm butchering it. Dot com. Um, this is just to make sure that we don't step on everything else. It's namespace, which means that this is a resource that exists on a per namespace basis versus a per cluster basis. Uh, and then it's called blue green deployment. And there's a bunch of metadata here so that you can do like cube control get BGD and actually see these things. So that's why. Uh, there's things like short names there, which is kind of fun. And then this is a type of Lambda controller, um, which is a meta controller thing here. And we really start to see how custom resource definitions can build on each other to really do some interesting stuff. And this is defining the parent resource is these blue-green deployments. And then the child resources are services and replica sets uh, across this entire thing. Um, and so the relationship between the parent resources and the child resources is something that, that honestly I'm a little confused about. I started reading the code a little bit, but I didn't want to spoil the, uh, spoil the thing. It's not something that's documented right now about how this thing actually creates relationships there. I think it either uses the unique ID that Kubernetes assigns to the parent resources as a label on the child resources, or there might be a way that you can have a similar to the way that replica set works that you can have a selector uh, in the parent resource and it magically knows how to read into the JSON and actually pull that thing out. But it uses labels to relate the parent resources and the child resources. It also looks like it sets up the right parent-child relationships so that the, the Kubernetes garbage collector works. And so the idea here being that you want to make it such that when you delete that parent resources, the child resources go along with it. 
Yeah, so duct type selector in the parent resource. Yeah, so that's that's what I started seeing in the code, but but I didn't get a chance to read it. And then what happens here is there's a client config here of what who do I want to call out every time one of these things changes so that we can go ahead and update it. Um, yeah, and then controller ref is the let's see. So controller ref is essentially the parent point, or there's like owner ref. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't dug into this, but there's there's all these sort of like meta pointers that you can do around that actually help to to visualize these relationships. These relationships are relatively loose, though, also. So there's this idea that if the labels match, then let's go ahead and fix that stuff up. And so that's another way to look at this. Um, and so this is really interesting. So this thing actually is going to call slash sync on this service. And... Um, and so there's some stuff that's that's left out here, which is CA bundle dot dot dot. <laughs> now there's a there's a huge amount of complexity behind that dot 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 there. Um, I don't know. Will this work, Anthony? If I just execute this as it is, or do I have to actually go through and, and edit that dot dot dot? But but what the problem here is is that as as the the blue green controller calls the webhook. Um, how do we cross authenticate those those guys? How does the blue green controller know that he's calling the guy that he that he thinks he's calling? And then how does that guy know that it's actually the blue green controller that's actually calling? And this is really this service to service authentication, which is largely missing in Kubernetes right now. We had a meeting of the workload identity working group this morning where we're covering this stuff. Um, so okay, so so Anthony's saying that like. The dot 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 doesn't do anything now. I'm thinking we're replacing it with Istio. Um, hey, I'm not going to try and pronounce your name. Good to see you. Your Cyrillic name, um, but like, um, so I think you know this is something where something like Istio can help out because Istio uh, uh, starts starts doing some authentication along the along the side. Uh, it's not easy. Like Istio is not here yet. Also, right? There aren't. I don't know if Istio like. What Istio does is you talk plain text between two things, don't think about it, and then it automatically encrypts and I d runs identity across these things. Exposing that identity back up to the application is not something that I've seen in Istio. Maybe it's supported now, and, and it's still very nascent about how you can actually start restricting who can call whom. So right now we know who's calling whom. Whether you're allowed to or not is something that's missing in Istio uh, currently. The Tigera folks did some really interesting stuff uh, with a essentially extended Envoy running in Istio to do this. Um, my take on this is we should be able to do this without like taking on the full weight of Istio. Uh, and so there's a lot of efforts of like, how can we start layering on identity without having to take on Istio? Um, and so a project like, like Spiffy get to that. Okay, so, but I think the, the TLDR is that this is ignored for now. <laughs> okay, Tim, nice to meet you. Yeah. Um, Okay, and uh, when is the next Heptio security course coming up? I don't know. We should maybe get Rope Moyer into, into doing a TGIK. That might actually be fun. Um, oh, you mean the training course? Um, I don't know. We were just reviewing some of that stuff with, uh, uh, with Ryan, our, 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 uh, who's leading up training right now. Um, uh, I don't know when the next, when the next sort of uh, training course for security is, but I'd, I'd like to do more security stuff with TGIK also. Uh, but uh, uh, so uh, reach out to me, uh, you know, or uh, on Twitter or whatever, and um, I can I can definitely hook you up with the training folks, and we can figure out when that next course is going to be held. Um, okay, so we have. This dot 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 I think sounds like it, sh it can be ignored right now. It doesn't do anything, but there's that's a placeholder of like, hey, we should be doing something there. <laughs> um, and then uh, let's see. So this actually defines this is input into the meta controller about what it should be doing, and then this is the thing that the meta controller is actually going to call, which um, is just running a Node.js server. And uh, it looks like Anthony had to do a little bit of, of build his own Node.js server to be able to deal with this. Um, and then we're pulling, let's see, and then we have a volume amount where we're actually pulling stuff from a config map. And so this is like really kind of a poor man serverless uh, where we're taking a generic container and then late binding, injecting in the code. Um, and that code ends up sitting in a config map. Um, 
it, this doesn't have to be a deployment. Um, it doesn't have to follow this pattern. Uh, the, you could run any server that can, you know, that can react to HTTP to be able to get this stuff up and working. Um, and then there's a service, and I think critically, we actually have the port mapped for this thing, so it probably uh, maybe introspects to figure out what port, or maybe just assumes that it's talking, talking port 80. All right, um, so there we go. So let's go through, and then here's an example of using it. Uh, or oh, actually, and then here's the code. So let's go ahead and run this just because I don't want to run out of time. So we can go through, and so the first thing we're going to do um, so we're going to do cube control create config map. Um, okay, so this is interesting. And Anthony, you tell me, does this have to be in the meta controller namespace, or could I run this in any namespace? Um, that's actually interesting also, because like, like is MetaController a shared thing or is it all sort of in that same namespace? But we'll go ahead and we'll do this right now in this namespace. And there's something with my path where, let's see. No, like it's not, ah, okay, to figure out. I think, I think it's an iTerm configuration thing. So anyway, so I, can crea I created, I think I did run that, right? Yeah, okay. So cube control dash n meta controller get config maps. We have it there, and if we actually get blue green controller, we actually see the code. So all the code is in a config map that gets mapped into the thing, and, and we're off to the races. So it doesn't have to be in the meta controller namespace, as Anthony saying, uh, but something was simpler. Was simpler. Don't remember what it was. Okay, so things were a little bit simpler doing that. We won't complicate ourselves out the gate, and then we can go through and we actually run the thing. So cube control dash n meta controller get pods. And so what this is doing now is it's downloading that generic Node.js controller. It's running it. And then as it boots up, it's going to pull the code out of a volume that's mounted in. That volume is sourced from a config map. Uh, so like I said, this is kind of poor man serverless. Um, and this this would work well with serverless stuff. And I believe early on, Anthony, you were you were basing this on a uh, you were taking a dependency on a serverless framework. Um, I'm not sure which one, but then uh, change things up and 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 remove that dependency. Okay, I don't know why this is taking so long. It shouldn't be taking this long. Let's see, how big is that container? <laughs> All right. Well, let's as that as that's going. Let's go through. We're not going to run it yet because we'll wait till it's up. Let's look at the code. And so this is JavaScript, and it's. I think the interesting thing is, it's plain old JavaScript. I mean, we're not doing any pre-processing. I guess you could make this super fancy if you wanted to, but this is plain old Node code. Um, I am not a JavaScript script expert, but let's try and figure things out. Um, it looks like. I'm guessing that the, and here's the, the Node.js container that we're actually running. I'm guessing what this thing does is, create server, reads the request body, and then, hook, fission IO. Okay, so yeah, we're using fission.io. And so it's the same code. I think what I'm guessing is that based on sort of like, okay, yeah, here you go. So you go through and you you load from the hooks directory and then you import it and then the, the name of the file is the name of the hook. And so it's just a very simple mapping of the files. So since this thing is called sync.js, it's gonna be hosted on an endpoint called slash sync and, uh, and it's exporting a single function. And that function takes input and then uh, returns a, an object that is essentially a 200 with the desired and then, and then a content header. So pretty straightforward mapping. This is very much a serverless pattern. Um, there's some sort of configuration by convention here because the name of the file turns into the, uh, turns into the name of the hook. And so like here we can see, where did I see it? In the Lambda controller slash sync where this comes from is, uh, 
is uh, the name of this file here. So if we change this to foo, we could change this file to foo, run and re regenerate the config map, and there we go. Okay, so what does this do? So this actually has observed and desired. Um, desired has status and children. Um, I don't know, I think if we look at APIs here, we'll probably see the definition of these. So this is Lambda. Is there, I mean, Anthony, maybe you know, like, is there the context that gets passed in and out? Is there a schema someplace that actually describe what that context looks like? That's something that I'm wondering about. Um, but let's read the code here. Because um, I'm wondering, like, what, what is status and children here? What do I put in status? I guess we'll figure that out as we read the code. I didn't see that anywhere in the docs. And, and on my sort of quick scan of the code, I didn't see it. Okay, so the observed children, we're going to look at, so, so those structs are in the top level dir. Okay, so we'll go ahead and, is it, in, I guess it's maybe in Lambda controller? No, no, that's not it. Um, Main.go, this is probably going to have. No. Uh, dynamic clients at dynamic discovery .go. I don't think that's it. Oh, lambda lambda hooks .go. Sorry. Okay. There you go. Okay. All right. So here we go. Yeah. So um, so the request we have the current set of parents and children. Then coming back, we have status and children. Status is a map of strings to something and then a bunch of unstructured whatevers. Um, and so, and then child map is also a set of strings to strings to unstructured whatevers. Okay. Yeah, so that's, uh, that is a schema, I guess. <laughs> it's a fairly, it's a fairly generic schema. All right, so let's look at the code here. Um, so, so what we need to do, okay, and then also let's look at my, an example here. So what we have here is we have replicas, we have the selector for the children, and so match labels, nginx front end. We have the template, uh, nginx front end, 179 container port. So this is the template of the pod. And then we have here the service that we're actually manipulating here. And so this actually is both creating and managing the service also. And so this is one of those reasons why I'm guessing blue-green deployment wasn't actually included in, in the deployment object that's officially part of Kubernetes is because it, it has to start manipulating yet another object. And so that's a pretty big change. And so do you want to try and shoehorn the relationship between, between deployment and service into the existing deployment or is it better off to create a new one? And so I think I agree that it's better off to create a new one. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to create that. So we're going to look at the service and we're going to look for observed children. Okay, so this must be, okay. So the children is a map of, of let's see, so this is the, this would be the, the type version and then I assume like service is part of core. So not sure how, because like whenever you're identifying objects in Kubernetes, it's a combination of, of the object, the version, and the object type, the version, and then the API group. And so I don't see the API group in here, which means it's probably core, but it's not clear. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So if it's the, if you have an API group like extensions V1, beta 1, that's the way that you would go ahead and do that. And I believe, and like, this stuff is so complicated. There's sometimes the same object can be exposed multiple times under different versions, right? And so I believe when we define the controller, we're actually specifying which versions we actually want. So we're identifying objects with, with the version of that object that we want of that representation. All right, so observed replica sets. We actually have a set of replica sets that we're gonna observe. We have a set of children. Um, Let's see, do we, if we already have a service, then we'll operate with that. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and create a new service. Um, active color. So we actually, we have an idea of which color we're actually active with right now. Uh, and then 
desired children. Okay, so we want to create the, the, the service and we'll go ahead and make sure that that is actually created. And one of the interesting things here that is not obvious is, so this takes the service there and actually does a, a deep copy of it and um, sets the selector to blue. One of the interesting things here is that you might expect that if I go through and change the service here, that it will go and update the service also. Um, that's not the case. This, it looks like the controller here will only initialize the service. It won't actually update the service. So that means that you could create the service out of band of the blue green controller. Um, and let's see, so we get the active color. Uh, let's see, bad things happen if the active color is not set, right? I don't know, maybe. And then we can, so we have a set of replica sets and so we can create or update the two replica sets. And then we wanna make sure that both replica sets are in place at the same time. And it says, is the active replica set based on the most up-to-date pod template? And so then we go through and we say, which one is active? Okay, so I guess, you know, if you don't set the, if you don't have a color set, it'll probably default to, to green. Um, blue, then we actually, okay, so it figures out which one's which, active and inactive between these two. And then it goes through and uh, sets the set, the number of replicas, and then does a sort of deep pod template equal of these two things. Um, so this is like, so this deep equal of the template with, okay, ha, so this is, so I'm sure Annie, Anthony stumbled over this too. Um, this, is, this is one of those problems with initializers in Kubernetes. When you actually create a pod in Kubernetes, there's a whole bunch of things that are part of that pod submission pipeline that set you know, default into that, right? And so that means that if you go ahead and if you upload some YAML or if you upload a definition and then you immediately download it again, you won't get the exact same thing back. And so, uh, so that means it's hard to figure out, hey, has anything changed here? So, and this is something that Cube Control does with Cube Control Apply. It looks like Anthony is storing here an annotation, which is the original state of what he set into that. And so this is the pattern that we see is that you have a, an annotation for the stuff that you set in and then whatever other people muck with, they muck with and you don't worry about that too much. Um, this works okay for pods. If you start doing things like services, you have to actually take some of the stuff that people mucked with and actually propagate that back into your uh, back into your, your templates. Uh, things like if you're doing a, 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 uh, uh, a node port on a service, if you, if you push a new version of that service and you set the node port to blank again, it'll get initialized again. And then what you'll find is that every time you do an update, your node port changes. Um, this is one of those things, subtleties of working with the Kubernetes API that really sucks. <laughs> uh, but the way that, that, that this code is getting around it is actually just storing an annotation in there and then assuming that nobody else is mucking with it. This would not work well with, say, a, uh, a horizontal pod autoscaling, right? So first of all, HPA doesn't know about this type of deployment, but even if it did, um, this thing uh, doesn't... Well, I guess maybe it might work. I don't know, because it might muck with the replicas here. But regardless, okay. So here we go. Okay, so no rollout necessary. So if 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 what we have is the same, then um, and everything is good, then we go through and we say the inactive one has replicas equal to zero. If if uh, our current definition of what we want is equal to the inactive one. Then we go through and we say, well, we want the number of replicas in the inactive one to be full power. And then we actually say, well, is the inactive one sort of done in terms of the number of available replicas? If so, then we go ahead and we actually swap the colors. And the way that that's done is you just set a selector on the, on the, the service. And then if neither one matches, that means that like during a rollout, somebody did another update, then what what this does is it starts a new rollout. So it says if inactive spec replicas equals zero inactive status. And so, so 
if we're doing it in a clean way, some other rollout was in progress, we need to cancel it and wait. Okay. So if, if you're in the middle of a rollout and then you change your mind and you actually update yet again, this thing essentially says, well, let's cancel the old rollout and let's wait until everything uh, uh, settles down and then we'll go ahead and we'll start a new rollout. And so this assumes that, um, so this is, this is another pattern that you'll see is that this wait here means that this code is assuming that it'll be called again as things change. And so this also talks about the assumption of you, you sort of write this thing as a one-shot type of mode of what you want. And then you assume that you're gonna have some higher level framework that's actually gonna be calling you multiple times. And then uh, compute the controller status. Okay, so we have desired, oh, I see. So status here is the status that gets written back into the status stanza of the, uh, of the parent object. And so we actually talk about the active color and then the status of the inactive ones. And then, boom, we're done. If anything fails, return a 500. And, uh, okay, let's play with this. This sounds like fun. Okay, so. Let's see if they, we're up and running now. And so. Uh, okay, so, and we're doing the my blue. I, I'm going to change some stuff here. So let just so that we can we can see this stuff better because nginx well convenient is a crappy way to actually do this stuff um, and I'm going to do my core D demo and I always have to copy this Stay with me here. I'm getting OCD about this. Okay. And so ports, uh, 80, service, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll do that. And Selector, I always forget. Sorry. Um, stay with me, guys. Sorry. I always forget the syntax for for service for how we actually map things. So you're seeing me look this stuff up. Okay. So ports, TCP, target port is the one that I wanted. Okay. Okay, so this is going to say I want a type equal load balancer, blah, blah, blah. Let's go ahead and see if that works. All right, cube control apply dash F my blue green. Blue green deployment QRD created. Um, so now I'm doing this in the default namespace. Um, oh, look, and we have stuff running. It's already running. Um, it's going to take way too freaking long for the for the load balancer to come up, but what we can do here is services to of QWERTY friend. All right. So what we can see here is that the service got created and the selector is blue. So that label got added on top of there. And we're still pending with the stupid cloud provider. I think nobody's complaining about that, so hopefully it'll shoot. All right, well, let's let's hack some stuff together here. So what we're going to do is we have an SSH. Uh, oh, God. Um, I don't know why this thing 
is wrapping around like that. Okay, so if we do this, we're gonna do um, we're gonna do we're gonna do local of eighty eighty two. Right, okay, so sorry. So I don't know, okay, so what I'm expecting to see here, just so that you know, is that the external IP here for this load balancer should actually create an ELB for me. My ELB is not getting created. I don't know why, that's a pain in the butt. So what I'm gonna do is I have a command line here that I copied from our example. Um, oh, my credentials are, no, okay, there we go. So I have a command line here that is essentially, how do I actually SSH into the master? Now the master is a node also, and when you actually create a node of type, uh, of type load balancer, it uses a node port under the cover. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna construct an SSH line that'll take me through a bastion to the master and do a, uh, do a port forward that way. Now we could use cube control port forward, but currently cube control port forward only goes to individual pods and it's gonna be difficult for us to actually model an upgrade when we're go ahead, going ahead and doing that stuff because we'll have to name a specific pod and that kind of defeats the purpose of rewriting the service link. Okay, so let's go through and um, so there we have, okay, so let's copy this. Um, and I think if I do L, we wanna go from 8080 to local host port Oh, oh, darn it, okay. L8080 and then 30967. Oh, addresser, I'm already running something on 8080. Okay, let's do, I have random stuff happening on my machine apparently. We'll do 8081. I'll have to figure out what's running on 8080 later. Okay, so now we're going ahead and if I do localhost, 8081. Look at that. Okay, that's exactly what we expect. And what we'll see here is that the blue is actually in the name here because QuarD actually shows you the, the host name that it's running on. And that actually, uh, when when the the child replica sets get defined as part of the blue green deployment, it actually puts that in the name. Okay, so that's great. So now what we're going to do is we're going to update this. We're going to go to version two here. Of, uh, of QuarD, right Right now we can see that we're running version one here. Um, I should probably make that more, more apparent. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. And now if I just do the apply, uh, oh shoot, okay, let me open another tab. Uh, CD, uh, TGIK. Um, my terminal is messed up. I have to figure out what's going on. I think it's new version of iTerm screwed things up. Uh, now we'll go through and we'll look at blue green. Okay, so now we'll do a cube control apply dash f my blue green. Um, and let's see what happens there. Okay, so that reconfigured it. So now, okay, so we haven't. We have the green ones are running and it's terminating the blue ones and boom, we're switched over to green. So, all right, that's super cool. <laughs> that's really, really cool. That is some Gandalf le level wizard shit right there. Um, so, <laughs> so what happened is, is just, you know, to, to clarify this is there's a little bit of code here that's sort of doing a lot of copy and pasting of JavaScripty type of stuff to orchestrate the spin up and spin down of replica sets to do blue green deployment. And then as that's successful, it's switching over a service. So it's coordinating across three different types of child objects, the, the replica set, the blue, the green replica set, and then the, um, and then the service. And that's all done in, I don't know, 130 lines plus a, including a, huge old copyright header of, um, of JavaScript, which is really, really neat. Um, and so I think that is super cool and it works. Um, so yeah, so, so that is, I mean, I didn't write one of these from scratch. I mean, obviously 
using an, an example versus writing one from, from scratch is, is a very different thing. I think it might be fun to try and add some features to this to see like, hey, instead of do, doing blue green, could we actually go through and do like, you know, we could do blue green, we could actually have sort of versions and we could just sort of do a stair step of a version. We could do something where you're more explicit about which stage of your rollout that you're in, right? Okay, I want to you know, I want to hold in, like I want to bring up green and then I want to, I want to bring up my inactive one and I want to point my canary sort of, you know, service at it. That's something that we can look at also. Oh, and then we can also see, okay, yeah, I didn't point this out. There is version two there on this. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's really fun. I think it would, you know, if I was going to write this from scratch with a controller, I think it, it would definitely take me longer than it would take to, to write that JavaScript. So that is super cool stuff. Uh, and then um, now going back to the TGIK controller coming into this, I'm like, hey, could we re-implement this? I think um, one of the things that I'm guessing and I would love to, to, to sort of dig into this is I don't think that the, the meta controller works cross namespace. Um, if it did work cross, just because the, the way that it's doing child links doesn't really work across namespace either. But if it did work cross namespace, we could probably, I think we could probably make the, the, this controller work here. It would be actually a lot, lot easier to do. Um, but uh, I think that's an interesting thought exercise because the, the amount of sort of like, you know, actual sort of, you know, operations that were happening out of this controller was relatively minor. So much of this code that we were writing across three episodes was really just a lot of plumbing. Uh, Client Go is not the easiest thing to use. Um, and so you add all that stuff up. And I think, uh, I think it would be great to actually see more stuff being done with the, with the meta controller here. So yeah, so good job, Anthony. I think, you know, keep working on it. Um, uh, with that, I think I, you know, sort of, of getting into, into a whole new thing and maybe exploring one of the examples. I'm not quite sure I can fit anything in in the, in the time that we have here today. Any last questions before I sign off about this stuff? I think this is pretty exciting stuff. Nope. All right, I'm going to talk at you all a little bit more. The thing that I think w is interesting here is this idea of we have a standard set of patterns and then we have webhooks that actually let you enhance them. I think that that may have utility in, in some interesting ways. Because I look at like, you know, somebody brought up earlier stateful sets. Stateful sets are really interesting, but a lot of times you need some sort of domain specific life cycle hooks as part of that. Could we start taking some of the common patterns that we have and actually calling out to hooks to be able to, to sort of augment those controllers, right? So if I'm doing like, like could I come up with a deployment plus plus controller that has hooks for like, oh, like I'm starting the rollout, I'm ending the rollout. Um, a lot of times, or maybe like say a replica set, when you, when you ch reduce the number of replicas in a replica set, um, it assumes that all replicas are created equal and it really doesn't matter which of those replicas it goes ahead and kills. Um, so if you go from like five replicas in a replica set to four, it has to go through and delete one of those pods. There's no, um, there's no guarantee in terms of which pod it actually creates. And so when we were originally designing replica set, um, it was called replication controller then. One of the things that I thought about is like, hey, do we want to have sort of scale down policies, right? Do you want to take the newest one? Do you want to take the oldest one? Do you want to have, you know, take the one in alphabetical order because we do the random naming, right? Do we want to have a consistent way to go ahead and do this? And we never made that in there just because you know, the idea of it's a very application specific thing, which one is the best one to actually turn down? Uh, as we think about this idea of like taking standard controllers and then and then enhancing them with some simple logic, you could imagine that that you could have a, a, a webhook of which of these things do you want to turn down that maybe goes through and asks each of them, hey, like, you know, like, you know, give me some metrics, which one of you is least busiest, right? And that's actually something that's, that uh, uh, you may want to take into consideration as you're, as you're deciding your scale down policies. So yeah, I think, I think this is not the last time we're going to see interesting ways to extend the Kubernetes control plane with something as simple as, as you know, 100 lines of JavaScript. So very cool stuff. 
All right. Well, with that, I'm going to sign off unless folks have other questions, uh, other comments here. Um, thank you all very much for watching. Watching. I enjoy doing these things. And, and one of the things that was so gratifying for me is that a lot of folks came up to me during KubeCon and said, hey, I watch TGIK. I'm learning a lot. I really like, you know, how you screw up and then get yourself out of trouble. And I learn a lot from that also. So, um, so I'm going to keep doing these because I think folks are getting a lot out of them. Um, I love the feedback. If there's more topics that you want me to cover, uh, go ahead and let me know. Uh, other than that, spread the word. Let other folks know about the show. Um, you know, subscribe, like button, all that. God, I sound like a, a YouTube cliche. But um, otherwise, I will see you all next week. And uh, oh, yeah, we need TJ. We don't have a TJK logo, right? So if we're going to do T-shirts, we need a logo. But if we do get a logo, I want them to be reflective, right? I want them to like shine in the lights here. Uh, <laughs> so I'll see you all next week. Uh, everybody have a great weekend. Uh, talk to you later.